Can you tell me a little bit about what you were looking to find out and, and how you went about studying it? Well, the way that we approach this program and the whole study of the evaluation of early childhood programs is to try to look at long-term effects of these programs. The literature in early childhood has settled for a very low standard, generally speaking. Looking at treatment effects measured, say, a few months or maybe just a few years after the intervention is performed. That's dangerous because there are a lot of effects that change, so-called fade-out effects. and So that's one issue. So we wanted to look at long-term studies. and We've done several different long-term studies where we follow people, in some cases to the mid-30s, now into the, into the 40s, and most recently we have a study underway at age 55 for the period preschool children. So what we do in this program, what we do is different, is follow long-term outcomes. But then we do more than just look at treatment effects. Because the trouble is that many of these programs have hundreds of different measures. So there's an issue. You have hundreds of different measures about health, about earnings, about education, about crime, and so forth. And so they'll report effects. Here's an effect on crime. Here's an effect on... Okay, that's interesting. It is. And it's interesting to see that some of those effects persist at age 21, at age 30, at age 40, and now at age 55. So that's very good for Perry. For the ABC program, the Abecedarian program, that, those effects uh, certainly persisted through the mid-30s. So it's interesting to see if the effects persist. So we're looking at long-term follow-up because that's really what we're interested in as social planners, as people trying to, not social planners, but social scientists, policy makers. But in addition, we want to know how do you summarize all these effects? We can just count treatment effects ad nauseum. There are many of them. There's a danger too, by the way, the danger that a lot of the literature doesn't examine yet. And that is that if I have hundreds and hundreds of statistics, then I can, some of them are bound, just R.A. Fisher would have said, you know, if we have a 5% significance level, then 5% of the time we would pronounce something to be statistically significant uh, when it's not. I mean, this happens. This is the way, it's a probabilistic sample. It's a random sample. So Fisher would say, if we have 100 outcomes, on average, we'd expect to find about five of those outcomes to be statistically significant, even when they're not. So if people go through the hundred and find the top five they like, <laughs> they're going to find it statistically significant. We correct for that. So we, we worry about that. But then there's a deeper question. In public policy discussions today, early childhood programs are being sold in part by being socially you know, fair and just. And all that's true, by the way. I completely support that argument. But another argument, especially in the days of tight budgets when people are trying to come up with economically efficient policy, is to actually ask, what's the rate of return? What, is, what would you get if you invest in this child as opposed to invest in a passbook savings account or invest in the stock market or invest in a bridge, building a bridge, or invest in building a, uh, uh, a hospital? What's the rate of return? How much are you getting out of it? And how do these programs compete with other governmental programs? Or even if you're talking about philanthropists, private programs. How well these programs actually compete. And so what we can do then is actually show that these programs, we find the rate of return. So we summarize all these treatment effects that are produced with a number that's economically interpretable and that will give us a measure of how effective these programs are over the lifetime. And that, I think, is very important for public policy. And then when you look at that, you're finding rates of return with a PERI program, for example, of 10, eight, 7 to 10 percent per annum, which means that every dollar you invest in the child starting at age three is producing seven cents per year for the rest of their lifetime. That leads to hundreds of thousands of dollars gain. So the benefit cost ratio is like seven to one in terms of discounted benefits. And when we look at these programs, and, and if you look at the ABC program, which had substantial effects on health, reduced the savings on health, substantial effects on cost, on crime, cost of crime, uh, what happens is you get substantial reductions in a lot of social problems, increased education, increased participation in society, even measures that are hard to justify, like trust and, you know, um, uh, self-control and measures, we do see evidence of that. 
So what are we getting? What we're getting is the structure of, uh, of returns when we include the health returns are as high as 14% per annum, a huge benefit cost ratio. And these benefit cost ratios, you know, we're in an era now of very tight budgets where people are saying we don't want to waste government money. There's a view that most government funding is a waste of time, it's a waste of resources. So we account in all of our calculations for something that economists call the deadweight loss of taxation. What does that mean? If I tax you, say at 40 percent or 30 percent, whatever your tax bracket is, then you have an incentive on your own part to work less, maybe to save less, to do less, because literally you're, it's going to be taxed anyway. For 100 percent, you'd have no incentive to do anything. 40 percent gets a distortion. So people typically, so there's a lot of work. You know, you'll jigger your accounts in various ways. You'll, you know, you'll try to use certain kinds of investments you can write off. So people look at those distortions and they find it very high. We factor that into account. These numbers are inclusive of all of what economists would call the welfare costs of inflation. So these are numbers that would survive very hard public scrutiny. The most ardent supply-sider, the most ardent fiscal conservative would see this. And, and we've shown that. We've had meetings with Democrats and with Republicans both who've accepted and just understand the, the integrity of the studies and the value. What does this suggest, first of all, to the public and to policymakers when, when you have these numbers? Well, I think what it suggests to policymakers is that if you have a really good program, now, see, this is the danger. Bad programs, now, bad programs do harm, and that's one of the benefits of our studies, long term studies. We find that kids who are placed in very mediocre preschools, I mean, not the, not the quality of preschool we're talking about with these programs, can actually be harmed or there are no benefits, especially boys. Boys turn out to be more harmed by putting them into low quality daycare centers than girls. Girls seem more resilient. But both are not helped. I mean, it's not, boys are actually harmed, girls are not benefiting from those centers to the extent they would. In a, so quality is a big dimension. But if you put children, and these are all disadvantaged children in these studies, almost all the evidence is for disadvantaged children. And that's important. I'll tell you why it's important. Because we think, you know, it, we think, well, like people are talking about universal pre-K or universal this or that. The evidence isn't there for universality. But I'll tell you that my guess is, right now, if you ask what's the rate of return to a middle class mother reading to her child, nourishing her child, fostering her child, you're going to get rates of return far above 14 percent per annum. It just hasn't been measured. But we know that that kind of mother's love, that kind of very much engagement is a critical ingredient. So things that sound soft and fuzzy are very, very. So two things. Targeting where it's effective, I think, is really important. Look, there's a recent paper in Nature, uh, Human Behavior, just a new journal that was set in England, uh, set, just launched in England last January. It shows that about 80 percent of the social problems, whether it's drinking, whether it's obesity, whether it's crime, whether it's welfare participation, whether it's you know, a variety of path pathological conditions, are, in, are basically concentrated among individuals, about 20 percent of the population, maybe even a little less. And it's a 20 percent that is fairly predictable, even by age three, that people have IQ challenges, they have behavioral challenges, they're living in circumstances where you know, the, 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 it may be a single parent home where the mother is forced to go to work, has to go to work for income. Maybe there's very poor child care. And these environments turn out to be very much risk environments. So we can do something about the next generation. We can help the next generation. So I think a big finding from our study, one of the big returns, one of the many returns, we, in the study on the cost-benefit ratio, we looked not only at these returns I told you about health and so on, but we also look at the benefits for women's child care. Because child care and child development have too often been separated. So this program that we studied, the ABC program, is going like eight hours a day, nine hours actually, allowing women to work, allowing these women to go back to school. And usually, when I say women, virtually all of the single parent families in our study are women. So, I mean, it's, it's this, this was in the 1970s. I think it's still pretty much true that you have disadvantaged homes or disadvantaged mothers, uh, women. And so 
the childcare and so what we find is that we can promote work, we can promote attachment in a larger society by the mother herself. So we're promoting her activity, getting her more education. At the same time, we're benefiting her children. So there's a generation down the line. Now, we went to the Perry study and we have people at age 55. We have their children at age 55. We know how their children of the participants are doing at age 55. And there are substantial benefits for the children of the children who are in the program. So it's a third generation benefit. And you, if so any kind of social planning or any kind of social policy that's forward looking. You know, we build highways in the 1950s and 60s. And most people are very happy we have those highways. They're not happy with the highways because they haven't been renewed. We built a lot of airports. We did things that the Chinese are now doing routinely. We did that in the 1960s and 1970s. There was a book a few years ago about that could have been us. It was talking about China now doing what we used to do in the 60s. But when we did those things, we had a forward-looking perspective. Now we've moved to a stage where everything is like hand-to-mouth, short-term, and I think taking the long view is very, very important. I wanted to ask, if there were a takeaway, one clear message that you would want to make sure that parents would get from this. One thing that we study is how these programs actually benefit children. What is the mechanism by which they work? In other words, so we have this treatment. I can give you a list of things they have, you know, the qualification of the teachers, this, that, and that. But one thing is it's the eternal constant across all effective programs, at least early childhood programs, is encouraging the parents to interact with the child in a positive way. It's that love, actually I'd call it love, love and interaction. Many parents don't know. We know from the study of Annette LaRue, more recently Fabio Cunha, that many parents who are well-intentioned, by the way, they're very well-intentioned, simply don't know that reading to the child is of great benefit to the child. Read, they think the kid can't understand anything, the kid's too young. You know, there are a lot of misconceptions even today, especially among the disadvantaged populations. And to be honest, American society is polarizing very badly. You're getting a group of people who are just off the charts in some ways, disconnected from another group of people who know all of this to be true. So the point is, is that kind of, so parenting plays an enormously important role. There was a uh, book 10 years ago written by one of my colleagues who said, parents don't matter. Terrible book, but a terrible, ma no, terrible book, terrible book. I mean, it was, it was a cute book. It's not a serious book. But actually that was harmful because they were saying, there's a, there's a woman running around Washington, maybe you know her, called Julia, uh, Judy Rich Harris. And she's basically saying everything is genetically determined. That's just not true. Parenting matters. The more love, the more care you give, and we see it repeatedly. It's not well, as well studied as we should. Middle class mothers, I mean here I'm in Hyde Park, Chicago, <clears throat> where there's a Chicago neighborhood near the university. And you can see many of these women are very, very, and families, now it's men and women, reading usually intact families. You can see them on weekends and evenings taking their children out to events, actively engaged. That engagement is just essential. That love is essential. Letting the child, and I would say another part of it though, that we've learned, and this is also something that's emerged from our studies, is that children have to be able to fail. In other words, you learn a lot from failure. So what do good parents do? Good parents stand behind their children. So in the, in the current language, have their backs. But they let them experiment and find out what they're good at and what they're not good at. The danger, and it's been documented now, it's being documented, is the so-called helicopter parent who basically wants to make sure the kid is 100% successful, won't let the kid fail, will do the kid's homework for it, will not, you know, will basically coach the kid in various ways. All that's well-intentioned. It's, they don't want the child to be unhappy. <laughs> but I think everybody who's ever had any success in life has had failure in life, too. I mean, <laughs> a few years ago, this guy, Jack Ma, who's running this big company in China, was here talking with the mayor, talking with a group of us downtown. And he said, surprisingly, at his company, Alibaba, I think it's called, that what he was teaching, he was giving a university, he was basically had to set up a university where he was teaching his associates and his young 
associates in his firm how to fail and how to cope with failure and to proceed forward. So it's try and fail, try and fail. So grit, if you want to call it that, it's the ability to, but the, also the ability to take a risk. So you go out say, okay, I, I might want to be a great violinist. I take violin lessons. My teacher tells me I stink. That actually happened to me with piano lessons. I mean, my piano, she said, you'll never really play the piano very well. So I took up the tuba. <laughs> but I mean, the point is, is that that was useful. My, my, you know, my, my children are very good pianists. Uh, but the point is, is that experimenting is really crucial. But a good experiment is one that can sometimes lead to failure. That's, that's science, it's life. So I would say to parents, if I have advice, and I'm not, you know, I'm not a developmental psychologist, I'm not a psychologist, I'm an economist. But what I've seen is that this notion of letting the kid try and fail, getting them actively engaged. But in all these interventions around the world that have been successful, whether it's the, whether it's the nurse family partnership, whether it's the uh, ABC, whether it's Perry, when we measure it, we always see a beneficial effect on enhanced parent-child interactions. And there are studies around the world that just target like, there's some program in Ireland called Preparing for Life. Very low-cost program. It's teaching parents how to interact with the children. That's it. Just a few hours a month. And it's getting huge effects at age five. Now, I agree, we have to follow it forward. But the same is true of the Jamaica program that's now being replicated around the world. And not that highly skilled. It's just teaching the parents interaction and love. That's the missing ingredient. Undergraduate, master's, what's your title and your area of expertise? Well, I'm an economist. I'm a, I'm a PhD from Princeton University in economics. I was an undergraduate uh, mathematics major at Colorado College, a liberal arts college in Colorado Springs. And uh, my MA is in economics as well. So I've uh, basically been trained in economics. And my primary interest in economics through most of my life has been what's called labor economics, the economics of human capital, human development, uh, how to build skills, education, uh, and now more recently measurement of skills, like understanding the importance of cognitive and non-cognitive skills. So these, I think, are very important dimensions, and uh, I'm actively engaged in that. And we have a whole group of people, the Human Capital and Economic Opportunity Initiative, some 450 people around the world in various networks looking at different aspects of inequality and human development. So looking at health, looking at the importance of uh, markets, looking at the importance of measuring these phenomena in a correct way, mechanisms for kind of generating, uh, equalizing differentials, equalizing environments and rec targeting disadvantage in an efficient way. And then on top of that, other groups that are looking at things like uh, Oh, I don't know, some of the more standard things maybe, but uh, things about uh, some economic models of intergenerational mobility and so forth. So it's a lot of different networks. They're interconnected, but they also have their separate lives. So the beauty, and they're not all economists, by the way. There are many sociologists, many psychologists, many neuroscientists. So we're looking at various aspects of human development. And would it be correct to say that you focus on early childhood? Well, I have recently focused on early childhood, yes. I mean, I've been, I'll tell you how I got into it, though, if you're interested. I mean, I got, about 20 years ago, I was working a lot on job training programs. And these were programs that were done, primarily conducted by the evaluations by the Clinton administration. But they started these programs under Johnson. I mean, various versions of these jobs, they're still mentioned. Workforce, the Workforce and, and Improvement Act and various other acts have been passed. These are job training programs targeting usually young adults, sometimes in their 20s, males and females, and then adolescents. Again, people who are like 16 to 18 high school dropouts. And I was involved in a series of experiments where people were looking at what the long-term effects were of these job training programs. And we found disappointing results. I mean, they did work for young women, young adult women, young uh, adult women. They, so women who were kind of getting on their feet and usually maybe had dropped out of high school and then maybe went back to get a GD and then maybe a, a community college degree. That was working for them. For men, adult men, nothing. But for boys, 
in particular, and for girls, for boys it was actually negative. It had negative consequences being in the program. So they would have been better off having work experience. So anyway, the results of that whole battery of studies were very disappointing. Low economic rate of return. And so at the time, I was deeply worried about this uh, because I said, well, you know, there isn't much we can do. And we have this large disadvantaged population. It's getting worse now. So this is 20 years ago. Then I became aware of bodies of work about early childhood by actually lectures at the Erickson Institute here in Chicago, very, very prominent group here in Chicago. Um, but I heard a lecture by a neuroscientist showing the power of the early years on shaping the brain. I mean, this was, these were now extreme conditions, the Romanian infants and so forth. But I was totally excited by this. So then I started looking. And about that time, there was a book out called um, The Bell Curve by Murray and Hersey. And they were arguing that IQ was both genetically determined and that IQ was a major determinant of life earnings. And uh, the, the author of that book, the one who survived, uh, Murray, uh, used to come here. He, we, we talked a lot uh, just about the statistics of the book. I'm an econometrician, too. I work on statistics. So I'm thanked in the book. Others are thanked. But I, reading the book, I just became very concerned, you know, that IQ and so maybe if it was genetics, then there was just nothing we could do. And, you know, he had an ex radical proposal of putting low IQ people on reservations and protecting them. So then I just got interested in the subject. I will say that book triggered my enthusiasm. And then finding these interventions. So I got more and more interested. And as I got into the literature, I found two things. One, the literature was in a little bit of a mess. I mean, a lot of the developmental psychologists were not very, they weren't doing statistics at the level that most economists would insist. So I got interested in that. But then I got interested in this whole body of evidence showing what looked like. So then I got interested, talked to the people at the Perry study, got to the ABC studies. I talked to groups of these people running these studies, I had meetings with them, and I saw what they were doing. I inter visited many of these programs. And then I started saying, we should really put these in perspective of what a good life cycle program is. So that's what I'd done. So I basically plugged this into the life cycle. So, for example, here in Chicago, we have a very good elementary school intervention that's connected with the University of Chicago. The University of Chicago uh, 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 called Charter Consortium. It's a UCCS. It starts at age four, though. It's very successful in terms of raising test scores, at least through, like, sixth grade. Still early. It, by the way, so these ABC and Perry studies I love because they have this long-term follow-up. But still, following these measures, these short-term measures you have, then it's very, it's very successful. So you look at what, what's going on in those programs. A lot of the charter schools haven't worked. You know what it was? You know what it is? It's that they personalize the education. They start early. So they're starting about the same age, one year later than Perry. And they're doing a lot of interaction with a child. It's this personalized education where they recognize a child who's behind, they will provide mentors, and they will coach the child, and what will happen is they will make sure that every child is brought up to standard. Very labor-intensive process. But it's exactly what middle class, a lot of middle class and upper middle class parents are doing, either themselves or with people they hire. So we're doing, they're doing for them. So I say, to me, that's the eternal ingredient, that what you're getting is mentoring. There are job training programs that work. What do they do? They mentor. They teach the kid. We have these programs here in Chicago called One Goal. You take kids, inner city kids, on average, they're not the worst, they're not the best. You give them mentoring starting in 10th grade. You pilot them through high school graduation. And then you follow them for the first few years in the college. So you just mentor them. It's what parents do. And what happens? It's getting very successful results. So to me, the, that's the essential ingredient. I find that very exciting. That we're really understanding now. But now we just need to have much better measures of mentoring and parenting than we had before. So the whole idea of what makes a quality daycare, what makes a quality school, used to be teacher salaries, educational credentials, passing this exam or that. No, I think it has much more to do with the structure of, of the engagement between the, the, the caretaker, the parent, the mentor, whatever you want to call the person, the adult or adults in a person's life.